Join me in a moment of prayer, won't you? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Today's sermon title is Listening for the Echoes of Pentecost. And indeed, today we celebrate the holy day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down upon the disciples, inspiring them to speak in new languages and marking the beginning of the church itself. Yet, as this is reaching the conclusion of Jesus's story, we are already in the Christian calendar gearing up for us to tell the same story again, because today, May 31st, is also the visitation of Elizabeth by Mary, who goes bearing the uh, as yet uh, unborn Jesus. And this is one of the patterns that we have in Christianity, is that we tell these stories again and again in cycles to remind us of deeper truths and to hear echoes of one story upon another. Now, beyond it just being these two Christian holidays, it's also the Jewish holiday of Shavuot. Now, just like Easter um, runs parallel with Passover, so too does Pentecost run parallel with Shavuot. Now, Shavuot itself is something that the disciples probably celebrated, and it is in itself a double holy day. It marks on one level the start of the wheat harvest and the end of the barley harvest in Israel, but it also marks when the Jews were given the Torah on Mount Sinai. And oftentimes Christianity has these same sort of spiritual echoes that play out, because just as the coming of the Holy Spirit is essential to our Christian faith, so too is the gift of the Torah essential to our Jewish sisters and brothers. Uh, in many ways, you could almost look at them as being equally important. Now, Christianity is often founded with these echoes and hints that come from either our predecessor faiths or different cultures that we have associated with over time, and we grow together. And this is, uh, in my opinion at least, uh, a diversity. It is a gift. It is blessings that we are able to see God intersecting on so many different levels. And so as we celebrate this Pentecost, we also should be celebrating with our Jewish brethren and sistren that they too are receiving the Torah. Because our faith is not just built from one source, but from many sources. And if we try to shadow that or, or deny that or overcome that, oftentimes that harms our relationship with other faiths and other cultures. And these are the kinds of wounds that we need to help heal over time, because otherwise it will lead to things like uh, hatred and anti-Semitism and other ways in which religions have split from one another instead of coming together and recognizing that we share many of the same essential truths. Now, the story of Pentecost is a story that we have heard many times before, and one thing that I always like to remind us is whenever we are talking about miracles, it's not just the, the physical miracle that is important, it's what does it point us towards. And so if Pentecost was just about the miracle of disciples being able to speak in new languages, then really we all at this point are considered to be disciples as well, because through the wonders of our phones, we are able to have that same instantaneous translation that they enjoyed all those years before. Yet, I'm willing to guess that none of us feel like we're prepared like disciples for helping spread God's word to quite that same extent. But instead, it's pointing to a deeper sign. It's a deeper truth. And again, this brings us back to another one of the echoes, because many theologians look at Pentecost as being the reversal of the curse of the Tower of Babel, when all of humanity was united with one language and one culture, and they were building this giant tower to heaven, and God got worried about the power that humans were showing, and so he gave us multiple languages to separate us from one another. And so this act of Pentecost is bringing us back together. But I think it's important to note that it's not that we have erased all of these different languages or all of these different cultures. Instead, we've been given the gifts to bridge between 
different languages, different cultures, different peoples, and different understandings. That this is showing us in some way that diversity itself was something that was worth preserving in God's eyes. That the diversity that we find in the world is something that honors, glorifies, and pleases God. Now, this is also, this idea is also shared with our reading from 1 Corinthians, where it talks about that we are baptized by the Spirit into one body that's made of many different parts. And then it goes on to say, if all were the one and same body part, what would happen to the body? We can't all be hands, feet, eyes, arms, um, or any other part of the body. We need diversity. We need the mix to truly do all of the things that God has called us and blessed us to do. As it says in 1 Corinthians, so the parts might have mutual concern for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part gets the glory, all the parts celebrate with it. We are reminded that we are connected together. And in hearing these two scriptures together, it almost makes me think of the spirit that is given to us in Pentecost as being somehow the beginning of the nervous system that knits the body of Christ together. That we are able to communicate across different parts, across different activities, across different times, different cultures, different ages, all different kinds of diversity to be united in Christ. And so we live in that inherent tension and paradox of unity and diversity. And so we see it echoed again and again in our lives. I think one thing that lines it up quite well is that we are also celebrating our graduates today, that we are honoring the ongoing truth that uh, there are always new voices being born that speak to God's presence and have an access to God's spirit. Now, for some of us, we really like this paradoxical idea of unity and diversity. Other people find it a little bit confusing. And that was true all the way back in the first Pentecost story. When the disciples came out, some of the people in the crowd said, aren't these Galileans? Are they drunk on new wine? Now, when they're talking about Galileans, you have to recognize the context of the time that Galilean essentially meant illiterate backwater hicks people that weren't worthy of respect. They were considered to be a underclass or less desirable uh, group of people that worship God. But again, 1 Corinthians calls us back to remember, instead, the parts of the body that people think are the weakest are the most necessary. The parts of the body that we think are less honorable are the ones we honor the most. And as we follow forward the story of the disciples, we see that play out over and over again. But yet, it is also important to recognize that, yes, indeed, these are new ideas, radical ideas, new skills, new talents that are playing out. This idea of new wine, um, it can be hard for people to comprehend. But it also reminds me of what Jesus said back in the Gospel of Mark that no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And that is part of what this Pentecost Sunday and the beginning of the church is teaching us as well, or is showing to us, or is echoing back to us again, that new wine, new ideas, new movements of the Spirit oftentimes requires new wineskins, that it won't easily fit into existing structures. And so even though the words that the disciples were preaching were the words of Jesus, and the words of Jesus could be seen both as a New Testament and a renewal of the Hebrew Testament, it ultimately led to not just one, but many different expressions of new faith. And just as it's true back then, so too is it true again and again in our Christian history. It seems like every 500 years, there is some new wine that bursts through the wineskins and causes us to find a new style of Christianity or new styles of Christianity. 
And I can't help but thinking that we might be getting into another one of those times again. I don't need to share with you how chaotic, crazy, and different the last few months have been with this pandemic. We've seen many wineskins burst as we've had new problems and new challenges put in front of us, and we're still trying to figure out how to best care for one another. But we've had even more disruption in the last few weeks and in the last week after uh, the reports of Ahmed Charbery being killed for jogging while black, Amy Cooper weaponizing her whiteness against a black man, Chris Cooper, that was just trying to look at birds, and of course the horrible film death of George Floyd under the knee of police officers in Minneapolis and the protests and the riots that have sprung up afterwards. I'm sure many of you are struggling for words just as I am. And so I try to fall back on the strength of the, my spiritual forebears, both the Bible, but also in this case, the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Back in 1968, he was giving a speech in the high school of Gross Point, Michigan. And he was talking about the riots that were going on in that time. And this is what he had to say. It is not enough for me to stand before you tonight and condemn riots. It would be morally irresponsible for me to do that without, at the same time, condemning the contingent, intolerable conditions that exist in our society. These conditions are the things that cause individuals to feel that they have no other alternative than to engage in violent rebellions to get attention. And I must say tonight that a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last 12 or 15 years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice and humanity. A riot is the language of the unheard important words to hear on this Pentecost Sunday when we are being charged to speak in new ways, to be able to be heard by different people, and perhaps also to listen to those that are also blessed by the Spirit that may be speaking in ways that we do not initially recognize. But there is always this tension between, as Dr. King put it, status quo and tranquility and justice and humanity. I'm not trying to preach politics, but I am trying to remind us that truly we are called to love all our neighbors. And as 1 Corinthians reminds us, that if one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. So what might be some of the words or some of the spirit that we're struggling to hear today when Pentecost fires might be able to be seen in the fires of burning buildings and cars, as disturbing as that might be. It might be a proverb that's been shared by Reverend Tracy Blackman, one of the national officers in our United Church of Christ. The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. That people are craving connection, community, and the warmth of embrace across communities. And if that is not to be found, it can drive to horrible ends. Or perhaps it is recognizing that we still have much more listening to do. Because just like we shared before, or I shared before, that Pentecost is not just existing by itself, that it also was built on the Jewish uh, festival of Shavuot, and it also lines up this year with the visitation of Elizabeth to Mary, or married to Elizabeth, sorry, we also have to recognize that the current troubles that we are going to are built upon and are echoes of earlier unresolved wounds. One that is particularly timely is that today, May 31st, is also the anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, which is also known as the destruction of Black Wall Street. You may have never heard this story before. Uh, a white mob, some of whom were deputized and given weapons by city officials, attacked residents, homes, and buildings in the predominantly black Greenwood neighborhood of Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. The event remains one of the worst incidents of racial violence in U.S. history and one of the least known. 
News reports were largely squelched, despite the fact that hundreds of people were killed and thousands left homeless. Estimates put property damage at 50 to $100 million in current U.S. currency. It is not that these riots, protests, however they are viewed, are going on. It's that they are echoes of deeper injustices that are out there that has still not yet been addressed and are only being brought to light and exacerbated by the other challenges that we're facing in this time of pandemic. But again, I'm reminded of the words in 1 Corinthians. If one part of the body suffers, all the parts suffer with it. A major part of the body of Christ here in the United States is suffering, and they are asking to no longer be ignored. Or to put it in a little bit different way, if one part of the body of Christ can't breathe, then all of the body of Christ can't breathe. And yet, just as the disciples were scoffed at for being drunk Galileans, so too do we need to listen to those who have been silenced, ignored, and rejected. So we need to, again, be learning to listen for the Spirit. God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the part with less honor, so that there won't be division in the body, and so the parts might have mutual concern for each other. In our United Church of Christ Constitution, we affirm the responsibility of the Church in each generation to make the historic faith, faith of Christ our own, in reality of worship, in honesty of thought and expression, and in the purity of heart before God. And so I maintain that the caring for the body of Christ and how it is suffering now is also listening to the Pentecostal spirit and making the historic faith our own. And so we need to faithfully begin to do our own work at listening. There are some uh, possibilities that I'm going to list links to in the bulletin right underneath this video. One is uh, something that's very timely that will be happening uh, tonight at 6 o'clock. It is a showing uh, by the UCC of the sermon, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, preached by Reverend Otis Moss. You can subscribe to that, and there'll be a discussion afterwards, and you can sign up for it um, on that link. I would also encourage us to ground ourselves, not just get caught up in the moment-to-moment -moment politics and discussion, but to remind ourselves of the different faith truths. I think one place to start, as I've encouraged us to do before, is to reread Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham Jail. And also to reread his speech, or read his speech, called The Other America that I quoted earlier. There are also many resources that are out there that are geared towards helping those of us that might not have examined uh, our own racial privileges and uh, biases. Uh, again, I will link to one in the, in the bulletin. It's called Anti-Racism Resources for White People. I invite us as we celebrate the spirit of Pentecost and celebrate the Holy Spirit coming down upon us and giving us new voice that we also pray that we are able to hear the echoes of justice as a central part of our Christian faith and in the Pentecostal spirit that we are seeking today and every day. Amen.